Welcome to Praise, Prayer and Preaching with the Rev. Dr. Rick Dacey, Senior Minister, Wesley Congregational Life. So Luke tells us that the tax collectors and sinners are all gathering around Jesus to hear what he has to say. The tax collectors, reviled, traitorous collaborators with the empire, and and sinners, people whose lives would be primarily defined by their brokenness in relationship with others, their brokenness in relationship with God, whose identity in the community would be essentially synonymous with their sin. And pay attention now. If you have your Bibles, pay attention. Luke isn't saying that it's the reformed sinners who are gathering around him, or the former tax collectors who are listening to what Jesus has to say. Now, these aren't people who have, you know, taken some wrong turns in life, but, you know, they've gotten it back on track. They've pulled themselves together, and now they're, they're going to Jesus meetings. No. No, these are not people with a checkered past. These are people with a checkered present. And worse than that, more than that, the people who are gathering all around Jesus, these people are trouble. Everyone knows that these people are trouble. Their their lives are full of trouble. These are the kinds of people who everyone would steer clear of. No one wants to be associated with the tax collectors, No one wants to get lumped in with the sinners, except Jesus. And the religious authorities, they're pretty wound up about this. This is not the only time we encounter this, but but, but here we encounter that the religious authorities are really wound up about him associating with these tax collectors and these sinners, because it's not just that these these sinners and tax collectors that are hanging around Jesus and listening to him, that would be bad enough. But what really offends the religious authorities is that Jesus welcomes these sinners and these tax collectors. He welcomes them and he eats with them. Hmm. He doesn't say, hey, you know, go get yourselves together. Get yourselves cleaned up and sorted out and and then come and hear my teaching when you're ready. No. No, he welcomes them and he eats with them. To welcome people and to eat with them is far more than tolerance or even acceptance. Welcoming people and eating with them is a celebration of covenant relationship and community with them in welcoming them and in eating with them jesus risks being lumped in with these people and he and he makes it clear that he is willing to take this risk that is a risk that jesus is willing to take these sinners are worth the risk jesus sees the religious religious authorities taking offense at what he's doing they he he hears their their clucking you know what i mean Mm. and their muttered and mumbling condemnation they're lumping jesus in with the people that he celebrates with and watch what he does watch what he does he doesn't get defensive he doesn't put up some sort of theological argument to try and deflect no He sees the Pharisees shaking heads. He hears their clucking and their muttering. And he gives them the most amazing response. He gives them the most amazing, this most amazing Jesus response to their judgment and their condemnation. He tells them three lost and found stories. Three lost and found celebration stories. The parable of the lost sheep, 
The parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost son, all three of those we see in in Luke chapter 15. Sometimes we take them individually, but Jesus presented them as a box set. He presented them as a trilogy. And he presented them as a as a a response that built and built in the in the ears and in the hearts of the hearers. Those religious authorities, those clucking, head-shaking religious authorities. And and the theme that ties these three parables together, there there are a number of themes that are woven through, but the, the central theme that ties these together is the theme of celebration. The shepherd finds the lost sheep and he throws a party to celebrate. The woman finds her lost coin and she throws a party to celebrate. The father finds his lost son and he throws a party to celebrate. You see the pattern here. And these are, in each parable, Jesus contrasts the pious, serious judgment of the Pharisees with the joyful celebration of heaven. In each parable, Jesus also connects the the celebration with the sinner's repentance. But notice this. And this is very important. Notice this. While the celebration is connected to the repentance, the celebration is not conditioned upon the repentance. Hmm? There's a connection, but not a condition. Look, the sheep has wandered off. The sheep that's wandered off has not repented. Hmm? This is not the the story of the remorseful sheep. He he, he tells of a shepherd who goes out to get the lost sheep, who goes out to find the lost sheep, and, and when he finds him, he joyfully puts him on his shoulders and he brings him home. And then he throws a party to celebrate. What what has the sheep done to deserve the shepherd's celebration? Nothing. All the sheep has done is get lost. The rest of the action is all the shepherds. Do you hear me, church? And it's the same with the coin. The the coin has not seen the error of its ways. We don't have a a confession of the coin. It says, well, from now on, I, I will stay with the rest of the drachmas. No. No, this is not about the coin's action. It hasn't resolved anything. No, the coin has done nothing to deserve the celebration that follows. But the woman, it's the woman who invites the whole neighborhood to celebrate with her because she values, because she treasures the coin. And even in the final parable, you know, we see, we see that the celebration is connected but not conditioned upon repentance the father what does the father do the father comes running out to meet the son while he is still far off before he even gets a chance to to offer his canned apology before he even gets a chance to beg to be taken on as a hired hand the father runs out to him and 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 then when the the son starts to give his apology when he starts to to show his contrition What does the father do? He interrupts him. With what? Celebration. These are are parables of the celebration of heaven. And they are Jesus' response to the clucking of the religious authorities. Of this Jesus who would lump himself in with sinners and tax collectors. This is Jesus' response. <laughs> the celebration. Celebration is woven all through. It's not when the sinner repents, then heaven celebrates. The celebration anticipates the repentance. 
He welcomes sinners and eats with them. The celebration anticipates the repentance, and the celebration culminates the repentance. And so we see that Jesus is happy to welcome and eat with sinners. He welcomes them as friends. He celebrates with them as they're part of the family because this is not a celebration of merit. This is a celebration of his grace, freely poured out. (laughs) But now, let's, let's set aside the theology for a moment, just for a moment. And think about what it's like if you're one of those sinners hanging around Jesus, listening for his word in your life. Think about what this experience is like, hearing his response to the religious authorities. Can you imagine what they're thinking right now? It reminds me of a man I know when he was a young boy, got bullied mercilessly. And... uh, he wasn't, he wasn't a fighter. And bullies see that as a, as a target uh, right on someone's back if they're not a fighter. Because bullies are all cowards. This, uh, this boy, he, he got bullied all the time uh, in school as he was young. And, uh, and there was one time when he was in uh, year eight. And he was sent on an errand to the principal's office with uh, somebody else in the class. His name was Scott Smith. Scott was about twice the boy's size. Uh, He was uh, the captain of the school baseball team, a star athlete in the school. And the two of them were sent to the office with some errand from their English teacher. So they're walking down the corridor of the the middle school, and they bump into Rob Fitzgerald. Rob uh, was one of the prime bullies. He's somebody who used to punch the boy in the arm once a day, uh, used to taunt him mercilessly. And so they run into to this Rob Fitzgerald, and Rob says to Scott, uh, doesn't talk to the boy, but addresses Scott, he says, Scott! What are you doing with this loser? Uh, it didn't say those exact words. I don't think they, that's, a, that's cleaning it up a little bit, making it a little more polite. Now, Scott at this point has a number of options for how he can respond. Scott can just ignore it, brush him off, or he can, uh, he can deflect it. Scott can say, yeah, I, I'm not with him. And we're just going on an errand to the office. What Scott said was really quite striking and had a tremendous impact. It was stunning to both the bully and the bullied. Scott's response to to Rob Fitzgerald, "What what are you doing with him? He's a loser. Scott was simply said, I like him. He's my friend. You have a problem with that, Rob? Rob didn't have a problem with that. But the young boy who had been bullied was astonished that Scott would call him friend, that Scott would lump himself in with him, that Scott would stand with him. And it had such an amazing impact on his life that he still remembers it to this day, decades later, as if it were yesterday. And in a sense, this is what Jesus is saying to the religious authorities. The religious authorities are trying to undermine Jesus. He welcomes sinners and eats with them. What are you doing with these losers? The religious authorities are trying to undermine him, but Jesus is not afraid to be lumped in with the outcasts. And through his words and his deeds, Jesus declares, these are my friends. I stand with them. God stands with them. And if you stand with God, 
then you stand with them too. Can you imagine what kind of impact Jesus' stand would have on these outcast sinners? It is the impact of grace. How about you? Where do you stand tonight? When you see Jesus celebrating with sinners, are you prepared to be part of that celebration? Or do you find yourself standing apart like the older son in the third parable who stands out in the field brooding, refusing to come in, not seeing what all the celebration is about? How did he deserve a celebration? Where's my celebration? If you're struggling with celebration, don't beat yourself up. Celebration is hard. Celebration is hard. But, but watch, watch how little children celebrate. You ever just watch them. Watch how they celebrate. With unrestrained, unfettered, unselfconscious joy. Little children know how to celebrate in a way that I think reflects the, the celebration that Jesus talks about in these parables. That Jesus describes the celebration of heaven. Y- years ago... Years ago, I, I served a church in Connecticut that had beautiful grounds with uh, just majestic maple trees, and particularly majestic in the autumn. I remember one, one day standing at the, the window of the church kitchen drinking my coffee, and I was looking out at these just majestic colors, these resplendent leaves in their brilliant peak red and gold and orange. And my first reaction was was to marvel at the breathtaking beauty of God's creation. As one season gives way to the next, we just just see this breathtaking beauty of God's creation. And I was almost ready to celebrate. (laughs) But then I had a second reaction. As I stood looking out the window... With my coffee in hand, I had a second reaction. Pretty soon, I thought, pretty soon all those leaves are going to come down from the trees. And they're going to be on the ground. And that means raking and bagging. Now, if you've ever lived in a part of the world where the trees lose all their leaves, you know what I'm talking about. You spend a whole Saturday raking up leaves and picking them up and putting them in bags and hauling them to the curb. And it takes you the whole day. Now, it's not the worst chore in the world for a, a nice, crisp autumn Saturday afternoon. It's not so bad the first time you do it. But you see, they're always the stragglers in the trees. Those leaves that are just hold, they're holding on there. They're mocking you. Looking down, you'll go ahead and rake up the rest. We'll come in our time. So, so then you find that they all come down for the second week. But by that time, inevitably, it rains. So all those leaves are become one heavy mass that they're trying to pick up. And it's, it's nothing like the first time when it was like, oh, this is kind of nice. Now it's getting really old. And you're picking up these heavy masses of leaves and you're putting them in the bags and you're hauling them to the curb, which would not be so bad, except that your neighbor... You see, your neighbor doesn't want to go out and uh, pick up leaves more than once, so they just let the leaves pile up in their yard, which then blow into your yard. So then you're out there for a third Saturday, raking up the leaves and putting them in bags and hauling them to the curb. It is irritating. It's a real pain, very annoying. So I'm standing there, I'm looking out the window, of the church kitchen holding my coffee cup and my impulse to celebrate the awesome wonder of God's creation has given way to the dread about the chore of raking. And just then, a class of three-year-olds from our church nursery, from our church preschool, come out onto the grounds on their way to the playground. And, and they, they're, they're milling about in the yard. And then I see one of these little three-year-olds spots a, a leaf 
on the ground. And he bends over, as only three-year-olds can, and he picks up the leaf, and he looks at it with this expression of awe and wonder. Like he's found something of tremendous value. And then the next moment, He's jumping up and down and he's waving the, the, the leaf in the air and he's calling his friends over to him. Five or six other friends come over and they're all looking at this glorious leaf. And then they realize that there are other leaves on the ground, just like it, red and gold and colorful leaves. And they're running around, they're picking them up and they're all waving them around and celebrating and they're having a party with leaves. And it was all very cute to watch. It was all very adorable, but it was something more than that. Something deeper than that. As I stood there in the church kitchen with my coffee cup in hand, it struck me that these little children had something that I had lost. Or I'd lost touch with. At least in connection with leaves. Those little children had a spirit of joyful celebration. I saw leaves and my mind turned to a chore. The children saw leaves and they had a spontaneous dance party. And it brought to mind the joyful, unfettered celebration of heaven. As we move through adolescence and into adulthood, our life experience can get in the way of our celebration, can it? Hmm? Our celebration gets covered over and muted, perhaps jaded. Our experience of pain and loss, our experience of bearing the weight of life's responsibility, our experience of rejection and failure, all these things have the capacity to squelch our spirit of celebration. And that's too bad. But it's one thing It's one thing if we struggle to celebrate a maple leaf or a coin or a sheep. It's another thing when our struggle to to celebrate gets projected onto others. When our struggle to celebrate causes us to disassociate ourselves from others. When our struggle to celebrate causes us to put distance between us and others, lest we be lumped in with them. That has eternal consequences. And, and, And we need to look ourselves in the mirror. We need to ask ourselves, are we reflecting the grace and love of Christ? Are we joining in the celebration of heaven? Real celebration is a gift of grace. It's not something that we can force or manufacture. Real celebration doesn't come from a a release of dopamine in our brains. Real celebration erupts from the depth of our soul when grace clears away the clutter of our hearts. Maybe, Maybe some of you have seen this. You seen this? A couple of weeks ago, a mother of an autistic child named Bo posted this picture uh, on Facebook. That's her son, Bo, in the foreground there. That day, uh, members of the Florida State Gridiron team visited Bo's school. Uh, in Tallahassee, Florida, the Florida State Gridiron team is there, it's as big as it gets. Most days, Bo eats his lunch alone, and you can see the, the distance between him and the other children here. It's as if they don't see him, or maybe they do see him. Maybe they're afraid if they sat down to celebrate to eat with him, they might get lumped in with him. So most days, Bo eats alone. But on this day, 
This day, he did not. This day was different. Florida State wide receiver Travis Rudolph asked Bo if he could sit down and share lunch with him. But Travis wasn't afraid to be associated with Bo. He was happy to be lumped in with him. And in her post, Bo's mom wrote, This is one day I didn't have to worry if my sweet son ate lunch alone. Because he sat across from someone who is a hero in many eyes. Can you see it? There's a little glimpse of heaven's celebration here. How about you? Are you ready to join the celebration? You know, I, I, I saw it with my own eyes this week. I walked into Wesley Connects this week where, where we come alongside people who are doing it tough. And, and we had uh, four, four of our disciples from our congregations were sitting there. It was just about lunchtime, and they were sharing a meal together. And, yeah, they looked like it had been a long morning. They looked tired, and yet they had a sense of peace and joy in them. It was extraordinary to see that peace and joy and to hear them talk about what a privilege it is, what a joy it is to stand alongside people who are doing it tough. I see it every week in people who come to draw out our best in, in singing God's praise and people who welcome everyone who comes to the Wesley Center with a hand of friendship for the people who work on the supper crew so that we can celebrate together. I see it in a, a man in our congregation who grew up as a street kid and who stood before hundreds of our community service frontline workers, people who have a tough job and who, who are out there coming alongside people in the hardest circumstances. And this, this man who had been a street kid, he shared with them his testimony of faith. And he thanked God for them. I see a glimpse of heaven's celebration there. And you don't think that celebration, I still to this day, months later, hear community service staff talk about how much that meant to them.